All right, hey everybody. Uh, welcome to the Innovation in VR talk, uh, developing for new mediums. So my name is Alex Schwartz. There's my face, really big. Uh, I'm the CEO and janitor of Alchemy Labs. So seven years ago when I started the company, janitor definitely applied, and I guess today it kind of does still apply. A uh, small company kind of have to do it all. But um, yeah, this is our team. Uh, we're a 22-person VR studio uh, based out of Austin. And so we've built a number of uh, products over the years in mobile and PC. Um, and then we dove into VR in the really early days. And uh, a recent update is that we were uh, recently acquired by Google. Um, so we're really excited to be working with a company that truly gets like where VR is going and understands that you know, in the long term, VR is kind of the way of interacting with computers. So um, it makes sense to, for us to be working together. And uh, yeah, we're best known for our game Job Simulator. Um, it was a launch title for essentially all VR platforms. Uh, it launched day zero on the Vive and PSVR and Oculus with Touch. And it became um, a popular game to show off the strengths of VR. Um, in addition, we built Rick and Morty VR. And uh, you know, we worked on that with uh, Adult Swim. They published it. And it was really awesome to work on an IP that was already like my favorite show on TV and then kind of got the opportunity to work on it. So that was, uh, that was pretty amazing. And so just want to do a quick show of hands. Uh, who here has tried high-end VR? And I, I say that as in VR that has hands that you can track. OK. So uh, for those of you that have, uh, this will make a lot of sense. Uh, for those of you who have not, uh, it might not connect. But I guess Alchemy at its core believes that hands are the magic that ties together everything about um, quality VR. And so um, we talk about this in the term of like active VR. So using your hands to engage with the world directly as opposed to passive VR where um, you know, you're just kind of visually watching something around you. And again, hands is where we think the magic is. So in Job Simulator, uh, you get to do a number of verbs with your hands. You can throw a stapler at your boss. Um, you can eat uh, moldy donuts out of the trash and then vomit everywhere. That's a thing you could do. Um, you can apparently mix cream into your coffee, and uh, the cream will adjust every milliliter in the cup via complex liquid simulation and do color blending. Uh, anyway, you can see we're using VR to its greatest potential here. Um, but, but seriously, it's the hands and the interaction that really sell the magic of VR. And so uh, when the folks from DICE asked uh, me to essentially dive into how did we get to where we are, how did we, uh, you know, what were the insights and takeaways from building in VR, I uh, kind of wanted to tell a quick story of how this happened and then some takeaways. So uh, I think a lot of people are going to remember that when the DK1 Kickstarter was announced, um, there was kind of a, a moment where I think a couple people realized there was a, a a potential here for a brand new market where brand new designs could emerge and new interactions could be built. Um, and so as a team, we actually dropped everything and we started work on taking a game that we had built uh, with Deja Bond Games called Ah, which is a skydiving base jumping game, and we ported it to VR. Um, and so we learned a ton through that process of bringing a game that already existed to VR. Uh, but really what we learned was what not to do in VR, uh, you, you dive off of a building and it's crazy motion and all that. But um, it was the early days we were the first game on Steam that had VR support that wasn't built by Valve. So that opportunity led to us being able to uh, kind of be at Steam Dev Days and kind of travel the world and speak about like what did we learn in VR, what was not working, mostly things that didn't work and things that made you sick and, and all that. Um, and from there, uh, we got invited to try out Valve's room demo. And so that was a really important uh, like life-changing moment where uh, it was almost like a this deep spiritual epiphany that this is what we want to do for the rest of our careers, that, that VR with this level of tracking can do something magical to your body and to your brain. And so we committed to that's what Alchemy is doing. Um, and so Valve approached us and said, hey, uh, do you want to try to build something with this crazy uh, hardware? And we said, of course, we'll drop everything, uh, even though it wasn't a great business decision at the time financially. And all of our advisors were telling us that you're insane. Uh, we did it anyway. So we flew up to Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada in January to my uh, co-founder, CTO's house. And uh, by the way, if you have an opportunity to go to Winnipeg in the winter, I highly recommend against it. Um, it was, uh, I think, negative 30 Fahrenheit. But 
Um, we were there, and we had one week to build an experimental something, but we were going to get this hardware delivered and then figure it out. We had no plan for what the interactions would be. Um, and so I, I just want to reiterate how janky this prototype was. Uh, it had five separate USB cables running from the head or the hands to a computer. Uh, it, was, it would shock you if you touched it in the wrong spot. And it was uh, held together with you know, duct tape and hot glue and dreams. But it did the trick of showing us what the potential of high-end VR could be. And so uh, the premise of Job Simulator, if you don't know it, is uh, in the future, robots have automated all of society. And so you go through this simulator to remember what it was like to job. And uh, you could work as a mechanic or a chef or an office worker. Now, you might think that we're just completely insane. Like, how do you, that idea does not just come out of a brainstorming session. It was no one's first plan for a piece of content. Turned out there was a very methodical process that led us to this design choice, which I'm going to unpack because it has relevant takeaways. So we had this perfect storm opportunity where you know, we've got this new hardware uh, that no one really knows what could work best for it. And then we've got this new tech with tracked hands and 90 hertz, 90 FPS head tracking. And maybe, hopefully, it'll come to consumers at one point in the future hope, and you know, uh, at some price that someone would want to buy. And uh, so we're like, cool, we got the hardware. We're going to plug it in and try all the stuff that Valve's going to give us to try it out. They gave us nothing. Uh, so thank you, Chet. Uh, the, there was no demo software, but um, it actually ended up being a really good idea because the first thing we did is we opened an empty Unity scene and we started to play around. And so the reason that we went down this path was because we had no demos. So what we did is we were in Unity and we made a table because we're standing uh, and so we wanted like a comfortable place to put something. We put three boxes on a table and then we made it so the first thing we did was add physics rigid bodies to the boxes and make it so that you could like pick up those individual boxes. Um, and so we found ourselves sitting on the floor playing with blocks like kids. Um, no, like literally sitting on the floor and giggling, you know, like so-called air quotes adults and we're just knocking over blocks and giggling and laying on the floor. And so uh, we realized there was something here that had to do with physics and your hands and something magical was emerging and uh, we weren't really necessarily predicting what would happen and we, we found all these, these great fun emergent properties. So, okay, physics that are near you, let's just do that, that's the game. Uh, so let's brainstorm what kind of areas in the world have places with lots of little things near you. And so the list was, oh, a kitchen's got lots of like, things and a, a office cubicles got some stuff you could pick up. Turned out all of those happened to be jobs. So when we opened the Google Doc and wrote, okay, well, here's our ideas brainstorming, the, the title was Job Simulator. And then, uh, you know, it, it kind of shipped with that temp name. So, whoops. Uh, but anyway, the hand presence is the thing that really we took away, is that we didn't expect the magic that comes about when you have fully tracked hand uh, association. And so, the phenomenon where your in-game tracked visual of where your hand is is aligned with where your brain feels your hand is located in space. Something clicks there that's not just, oh, it feels uh, close to real life. Something magical happens when you've got that alignment in your brain. And so when the mental effort to, to have to like, reach out and do something is zero, it, some magic is unlocked and it, it becomes kind of crazy. So, like, uh, natural interactions that humans have been doing all their lives, like reaching out and grabbing a cup, they just work because you've been training all your life how to do that. And so, like, if someone threw something directly at your face in VR, you instinctively block your face. Just, it's not something you thought of. It just happens because you're trying to protect your eyes. Um, and so, the, like, hand-eye coordination skills just emerge naturally in VR. Um, there's, like, a video of, like, okay, you have one second to react and you can catch you know, if, if, you're, if you're looking and you're, you have hand-eye coordination, you can catch that cake on its way to, be, you know, crashing to the ground. By the way, I could watch these, like, dad save videos all day long. Uh, here's a pretty good one. Um, I, okay, last one, I swear. Uh, this is a, a crazy close call. Got him. Anyway. So, like, yeah, hand-eye coordination just comes across. Like, uh, I've been juggling for most of my life, and we didn't code in any specific thing to allow for juggling. It just physics and accurate throws, it turned out that you could do that in Job Simulator while we were prototyping. So anyway, now you're the character in the game. You're no longer like playing an avatar uh, if you're first person. It's you are playing as you, so there's no longer like a set of abstractions that you have to follow, like, okay, what button do I hit to crouch? It's, oh, wow, okay, I could just actually reach over 
uh, reach down and pick that up. And when I saw in Resident Evil that there was an, actually a crouch button assigned to the controller, I weeped deep down uh, for, for myself and for VR. But, uh, you know, like, essentially, like, you play enough games over the course of, as game developers, uh, over many years, and you, you start to realize that there were thousands of hours put into the concept of mapping buttons to actions. And so there's a mental load that your brain goes through, which is to memorize what button does what. And so like I hit this button to unlock a door or this button to jump or crouch. And now we can build natural interactions where you just reach your hand out and do the thing in meet space. So uh, you know, this gives us accessibility like we've never had before. I could give job simulator to my grandma and she was able to play it without having any experience with video games and she, you know, it was, it's terrifying to have an Xbox controller in her hands because it's just too many buttons, but this, this just works. And so, again, when it all comes together, there's some level of magic that happens. Uh, some fun stories that I, I kind of have to tell is like, everyone in Job Simulator, when they eat something, like a donut, they open their actual mouth while they're doing it in VR. It's just a thing that we've noticed that it, the human tendency. And so, um, we've noticed that people start to get really comfortable in spaces and so, I've seen people try to close a door in Job Simulator by kicking it closed on their way out of the, like while turning. It, foot, your foot is not tracked at this time, but it just shows how sold your brain is on this idea. Um, I had a friend break a bunch of wine bottles on the ground in, in a level, and then she was actually playing in socks in the room that we were in, and for the rest of the time playing the game, she kept tiptoeing around the area where the glass was in the game, thinking, well, I, you know, I'm gonna cut my feet if I step on them. So it's, it's, it's pretty incredible, those types of things. And I guess we build all these systems and we go through all this work on meeting player expectations. And then something I see in so many VR games that it's just not quite working out is that players want to explore and they want to do something great and then it doesn't happen. And so I'm calling that interaction disappointment. Kind of want to talk about that, which is, well, we need to avoid it, obviously, but um, traditional games, you know, a level designer, creates a level and then they start world building in that level and they, cr they place items that make sense in that world but then all these props get created and then they get probably statically merged together to save on draw calls and all that. But if you grab for that mug on that table and you haven't thought about what it's like to be in VR, man is that disappointing to reach out and grab a cup and it doesn't do anything and it's just stuck there to the table. And so really I think it's like everything you reach for has to be grabbable but uh, you know, we're all just like, it's like a baby and you're dangling a toy in front of them and they can't quite reach it. So I think as players, we're all just like barely functioning adults in, in like babies' bodies, or you know, or we're, we're barely functioning children in, in adults' bodies, uh, but like inside your inner child is screaming, why can't I do this thing and, and getting very upset. So uh, yeah, everything that affords interaction needs to be interactable, uh, so, but it also has to be right. And that's where like the real rabbit hole begins. So your worldview has to match with what actually functions with that item. So if you finally, like, you say, oh, people kept grabbing for the cup, I'm gonna make it a real cup. Then someone's gonna take that cup and they're gonna walk it over to the closest water source and they're gonna try to scoop up some water into the cup or put a, the cup under a faucet because that's how cups work. And when that doesn't work, they're disappointed once again. And so if, if something that fits, you know, doesn't fit your worldview in VR, the whole system comes crashing down. And that means that as developers, you're going down this rabbit hole of trying to build the entire universe and simulate everything. Um, and so like we, some good stories of like where that failed was um, in the early version of, of the game. And, uh, we had these plates on a, uh, on a counter. And so uh, my friend picked up a plate, threw it on the floor, it didn't break, and then she said, this is the worst game ever. Like it was just instantly that like worldview mismatch. It's like, I'm done, I'm out. Uh, but now of course, you know, we had to implement plates breaking. Uh, um, players would reach out and try to grab um, the glasses on the robots in the game, we noticed. And so the first thing we did was we said, okay, fine, we can make it so you could do that. And then everyone wanted to try to put the glasses on their own face. And then we allowed that in the next iteration. And then we added hats to robots and then people wanted the hats. And so like the whole costuming system was built out of like a begrudging one step further, one step further, because players keep trying to do these things. But if you don't, again, like, disappointment. So either remove glasses from the game or make it work how they expect. Um, and the last thing was the liquid. I mean, this is, like, for our first task in the office, the joke had to be you get coffee as a human being, and, the, you know, that's what you do in an office. 
So we needed to, of course, build a fully functioning physics-based liquid system with you know, 90 FPS uh, solving and pouring and volume conservation and like color blending and temperature tracking and uh, you know, all of that for the joke. So the other thing we found is that you can break expectations if you mess up too many times. So like if you fail to grab something a couple times, you're not gonna continue to try, you're just gonna give up. You've, you've broken the contract with the player, it's over. And now they, they don't feel like the world is fun and they, they stopped. But uh, you know, what we found is that little subtle things actually break a, a part of that contract. So the idea of um, like force grab in a game that's supposed to feel more realistic, like if you point at something and say, I want that, and then it magnetizes and comes to you, that can actually break things in a really strange way. So here's an example of like force grab. I just point at something and I get it. Now the next time you're one foot away from something on a table, instead of walking over and grabbing it, you just, you don't walk, you just point and you hit the button. And then this weird shortcut has emerged and now no one wants to do anything. And so like everyone remembers Wii Bowling, right? Like everyone started playing Wii Bowling with the most amazing form and everyone's going to town and like just acting it perfectly. And then two hours in, you're just going like this because you realize what the accelerometer is actually doing and it's just tracking that rotation and you just give up. So like has, I don't know, in general you could think of VR as possibly being a shortcutless medium uh, where if you have real sixed off tracking, you could make something where the shortcuts are truly not possible if that's what your goal is to create fun through removing the concept of shortcuts. So for us, we made this level very specifically, the kitchen, there's a, you know, a cabinet on the right and there's a plate on the left and you have to get items from one side and bring them to the other and the distance between those two locations is just enough that I can't stand here and, and move things from left to right. I have to physically walk a half a step and then walk a half a step. And so that's more fun in our game to actually force the player to move than to, to try to allow for just, you know, like laser pointer movement and then I could just stand there and, and let it happen. So all these direct interactions are great, uh, but then you get to the point where you're like, well, that's all gonna fall apart when I need to put a menu in the game, right? Um, but we didn't wanna do the traditional, like what did games do for 30 years, uh, how to make a menu? It felt like a cop out to just put a plane and a laser and just, just do that. So we thought, well, how do we do it in the world? Um, and so it's like, well, what do you do in the game? You, you could hit things, you could throw things. I could like make a target and you throw it in exits or whatever. And we're li listing all the verbs that are possible in the game. And then we came up with, well, eating is a verb in the game. Why don't we make uh, an edible menu? And so that's where the exit burrito emerged. There's a burrito that spawns, it's exit, you eat it, really? You eat it a second time and then you've exited the game. So, I think it's just this really silly phenomenon that has kind of caught on as a weird thing, but it's a great example of like trying as hard as possible to not use prior design elements from many years of game design in VR because it's not applicable anymore. And so I guess that's like the, the big takeaway that I'm kind of trying to say is that all these examples are for building from the ground up for VR versus taking things that existed and trying to reapply them to this medium but it's really hard, hard to do and it's really time consuming and you feel like you're reinventing the wheel every time you do anything, including make a menu or do some basic thing that should just be like workable at this point. And so that, that seems to be the biggest thing that uh, we're seeing in VR right now is that people are looking at prior designs and they're building essentially uh, using paradigms from previous mediums and just applying them wholesale. So I get it, like it's really hard to build from the ground up and it's maybe like uh, super risky or you don't have enough money to, to reinvent everything. But I think that um, if you were to say, well, we can mitigate risk by just building a non-VR game and add a VR mode and then we can open up our market to you know 100X, that's going to essentially do a poor job of both. And you're not really mitigating your risk, you're just uh, avoiding the ability to make something truly great that you'd have to build from the ground up in VR. And so we've seen this before, like it, it, mobile was the same thing, right? Mobile early days led to some of the biggest like design atrocities that I can remember. Um, the early market just thought, well, we'll take games that we had and we'll put them on this phone. And so, you know, that's how you end up with virtual buttons on an iPhone, which is just a nightmare. And then eventually, finally, people got to the point where they're like, okay, let's take advantage of what is great about a touch screen. Let's uh, come up with the, the lexicon for input on, and touch. And, and then you've got Tiny Wings and Angry Birds and Flight Control and all that stuff. 
And so I guess let, like, let's not just jump straight to the take a 60-hour game, attach a VR camera to it, and then you know, profit. It just doesn't seem like the way to go when it comes to building from the ground up for VR. So, and I just, I see a lot of people talking about, well, I've got this whole world, how do I move within this world? And it's like, you know, you're hitting up against the issues with artificial locomotion and the nausea associated with shuttling around and the issues with teleportation and like going wherever you want at the drop of a hat and how that makes it so you don't want to move anymore. Um, fundamentally, these are just the problems with bolting on a movement solution to a prior medium's piece of content. And so I think we need to completely flip it around and say, well, what if we build a design from the ground up that takes into the account the strengths and the limitations of VR and says, well, why don't we do something new for this platform? And yeah, it, it takes time and money uh, and a lot of iteration and a lot of failure, um, which is why we try to show a lot of the failures that we've found over the years in our talks and all that. But I mean, I guess the challenge is to developers is like, can we build new genres? Can we build new experiences that never existed and new methods of interaction that we've never thought of? Uh, yeah, it's scary and it's risky, but like, is it really risky or is it riskier to do the super safe bet that everyone's gonna pass over because it's more of the same? So I think it's just hard to argue in the very, like many years from now when we look back, the only content that's truly gonna stand the test of time is the stuff that only worked in VR. And so I hope that we can do that. Thank you.